Well, you know, we are back with Rock Forever. We've got an amazing guest for you today. He, you know him as a member of the multi-platinum and award-winning group Sticks. Of course, as a solo artist and an amazing songwriter of hit artists for some major, major artists and a member of the ELO spinoff project, The Orchestra, we please welcome Glenn Burtnick. Yo! What's up, Glenn? Great to join you, man. I hear you out there on that Jersey Shore, man. It must be uh, nice. Everybody kind of opening up now and seeing a return to uh, hopefully uh, a, a summer season. Yes, it is. Yeah, we're starting to, you know, fill in some dates and uh, I'm actually starting to make live music again. That's something we definitely missed. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be locked down and have all this zoom and entertainment at home but there's nothing like that communal feeling of uh you know artists exchanging that energy with the audience man feeling that vibe going back and forth so i would love for you to give us a little bit of background uh growing up in that area i know of course you're a big beatles fan and we're part of uh the beatlemania production with uh playing mr paul sir paul um but give us a little bit of background, you know, growing up where you did, how you got into music and that, how that eventually evolved to your solo career. Well, I was raised in a family of music fans. There weren't really uh, any instruments around the house at first. And then the Beatles happened and I'm watching my older brothers because I was the youngest of three and, and, uh, watching their reaction to uh, popular, you know, teenage music of the 60s. And uh, that lured me in. Uh, and the first Beatles performance on Ed Sullivan, I got hooked on drums. And uh, Ringo was like my, a big inspiration. So I, so I started drum lessons when I was a kid. And I was a drummer for a while. But then guitars started finding their ways around the home. So I started figuring out how to do that. And um, uh, yeah, I started writing songs, right? As soon as I knew more than one chord, <laughs> I started making up songs. So this led to any number of gigs. Uh, you know, first I was a singer songwriter kind of guy. Well, not, not first, secondly, after I was a drummer in some bands. Um, then, I, uh, wow, then I went on tour with uh, some uh, big, bigger production bands like uh, House, just, you know, disco kind of stuff, because uh, uh, it was the early 70s by the time I got uh, playing bars. And then there was a, an ad in the Village Voice, the New York Village Voice, looking for Beatles sound-alike lookalikes. So I, I didn't really think much of it, but I thought, well, it's a good idea to audition for things. It's a good idea to stretch out. So I auditioned for the part of Paul and Beatlemania. At the time, people on occasion would tell me that I reminded them of McCartney because I had droopy eyes. And I'm left-handed and I play guitar and bass left-handed. So um, I got the gig. I, I was, uh, I performed in the role of Paul McCartney in the Broadway show Beatlemania for a year or two. And then I got tired of it. And then I joined um, Jan Hammer's band. He was the keyboard player for the Mahavishnu Orchestra, a really, really super talented synth guy that changed the way everybody played synthesizer. And he's probably best known for the, uh, the soundtrack to Miami Vice. And I, you know, and then I just started making records with different artists. Um, I was in a band called Cats on a Smooth Surface, uh, who were kind of big down here on the Jersey Shore. And that's when I first started playing uh, with Bruce Springsteen. Bruce would come by the club and play with us from time to time. And uh, after that, there was another band called La Bamba and the Hubcaps. This is not really fascinating. Uh, details but in any case i ended up getting a uh, solo record deal with AM records in the mid to late 80s 
And I put out two albums and some other singles. I had a song in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure soundtrack. And, uh, and a top 40 single, a song called Follow You. But um, then I was asked by the band Styx to replace Tommy Shaw, who Styx had broken up and then they were going to have a reunion. But Tommy, when it was time for the reunion, Tommy was busy with Damn Yankees. So they needed somebody in the role of Tommy Shaw. So I recorded an album and toured uh, an album called Edge of the Century, uh, which was based on some songs of mine. Uh, Edge of the Century was a song of mine. The first single was Love is the Ritual, a song of mine. Um, I became... Well, in that case, I was a lead guitarist, singer, songwriter, but I also kind of got deeply into my songwriting, which led to me working with people like uh, John Waite and uh, Patti Smythe, who recorded a song of ours with Don Henley, which was my biggest single called Sometimes Love Just Ain't Enough, and, um, uh, and a lot of other songs that I got out there. Uh, including a number one uh, country ballad by um, Randy Travis and a bunch of other things, just, just, just tons of songs that I became a songwriter for a living and did that for a while and eventually started playing out again, uh, recording solo albums, in, uh, independent solo albums. And, uh, you know, I kept it going because I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> so this is what I do. I perform music and I write music and that's what I'm still doing. And I guess I'll do it until I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your enduring career. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the whole world changed, you know, when the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan and no matter what age you were, I was a couple of years younger than you, uh, but my family moved to England right after that. So I'm, I'm like oh. deep in the middle of the British invasion, you know, mm. over there. And I always wondered how the sales of guitars and bass and drums shot up after those appearances. It seemed like every, every guy in America wanted to form a garage band and, you know, have teenage screaming girls at their feet. You know, it was just a, <laughs> it was a phenomenon that uh, who knows if it will ever ever happen again, but I, I'm sure initially that was exciting to be on Broadway and to be play, playing those songs. But um, like you say, after a while, it, it was it was like, God, the Beatles didn't start this way. They they, they were, you know, in, in, in front of a, a small club and it just kept growing as their songs grew. But uh, yeah, no, that's, that's super cool. Now, obviously uh, seeing and collaborating with Bruce Springsteen, I've met Bruce a couple of times and it always amazes me sometimes how the, the 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 bigger the star, the more down to earth and humble they are. You know, yes, they're successful, but in their minds, they're just a you know a singer, musician, music fan. You know, was that was that your impression of Bruce when he would show up at the club and want to jam? For sure. I mean, deep down, I think everybody, including the most arrogant rock star, uh, you know, when, if you really get into who they are and, and what they come from, it's, you know, we're all human, everybody's human. Bruce is a very, uh, really friendly guy to this day. You know, I see him from time to time because I live down here in Asbury Park and, and, uh, and when I run into him, he always makes me feel great. You know, he's like, hey, Glenn, you know, just the fact that uh, he's like the Elvis of our time right now, I guess you might say, or maybe he was the Elvis of the, the 80s or something, whatever. But he uh, he's friendly he, and uh, he makes me feel uh, like we're friends. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, that's awesome to hear, you know. Now, obviously, Sticks had a, a big history prior to you, even prior to Tommy Shaw, you know, Styx was around, you know, from, from the lady days, you know, early, early seventies out of Chicago. And, and they, they always uh, kept evolving. 
Now, um, coming in with Edge of the Century and, and some of your concepts and, and, and songs, what were the highlights for you to go from being that solo artist now to being a part of this, uh, you know, America's, you know, favorite, you know, AOR band, you know, Sticks? It was a, it was wonderful. It was, you know, bigger audiences, you know, and uh, yeah, just great to put out a record and have it played automatically played on radio stations across America. Um, that, you know, it was a bit more of a struggle when I was a solo artist on AM records um, uh, to get people to notice and, and understandably, you know, in the wake of the Beatles, there were just, so many acts, so many artists and uh, so much music and, you know, generation after generation of, of people like myself who, you know, I often wonder would I have been a, a musician had it not been for growing up in the 60s, you know, but um, in any case, the Styx uh, shows were wonderful. You know, I did a tour and, and that album, Edge of the Century, we toured and, and we had a couple of hits off the album. And then, and then Tommy came back, but their longtime bassist, the originator, uh, Chuck became ill, he fell ill. And I was asked to come back into the band as the bass player, which I did. And uh, so I, this was the second guy in the band whose place I took. Um, so that was kind of interesting, you know, wearing a different hat with that band. Um, and uh, it was all good. It was cool. Then I made another record with them, uh, Cyclorama, it was called, and, uh, you know, wrote some more songs on that. And we all collaborated. And uh, but by then, Dennis wasn't in the band. So I had been with Sticks. I'd been in Sticks without Tommy, but with JY, Dennis, and Chuck and John Pinozzo. And then I came back later in sticks without Dennis and without John who passed away sadly, but with JY again and Tommy Shaw, you know? So I, it was like, there was a divorce between these two sides of sticks and uh, I, I guess I, I guess I might be the only guy to have been in both. No, that's not true, JY. But in any case, uh, the, it was an interesting affair to be a part of uh, having both sides, being friendly to both sides of, the, of a divorce, really. Yeah, I know you later, you know, toured and performed with Dennis. And of course, he's the original voice of Sticks, but I guess as the band evolved, especially with Tommy's, you know, youthful energy. I guess they felt like, man, we gotta, we gotta stay current. You know, we gotta, you know, D Dennis is getting a little schmaltzy and, you know, take, taking us down um, the easy listening road. And, and we gotta continue to be a rock band to, to bring in new audiences. Is that kind of how you saw the divorce, you know, JY and, Tommy wanted to keep it rockier. Uh, yeah, that's kind of a, a that's that's kind of a good summary. I mean, I, you know, it's problematic. It, it's not a simple thing because Dennis supplied Sticks' biggest hits. He always did. He always will, for better or for worse. Uh, and the other faction of the band felt like you know. Mr. Roboto, which is one of their biggest hits, they just kind of felt that it, it was a step too far. They wanted to be a, a heavier rock band. And they were, they were both sides, you know, they were like a prog band, they were a pop band. And then Babe was this huge monster ballad. And so I guess that uh, JY and Tommy weren't thrilled with the direction. But also there's personality conflicts, you know, um, and there's always going to be that. Bands are difficult. 
um, you know, we're talking about the Beatles earlier, man. What did they last? Eight years? You know, I, it's unbelievable to be the biggest band in the world. Now, the Rolling Stones have managed somehow to kind of keep it going, but and Aerosmith, and there are other bands, but uh, it, it's really hard for adults to put up with each other after a while, especially when you're successful. When you, you all this money is coming in, and you you know, and you've got your w- wife telling you that you're the most important guy in the band, and and you know, you got your friends telling you that you're the most important guy in the band, and then you look at these other guys in the band, and and you feel like you're not getting the respect from them. Um, I think that that's a very common thing in rock bands. You know, psychologically, you walk out on stage and you're treated like a god. You know, and I still get to experience this with the orchestra and some of my other projects where, you know, at the end of the show, you'll have thousands and thousands, you know, 10,000 people at times standing up cheering and and screaming and you know you just walk off stage feeling like wow i'm really i must really be great i must really be important and uh you know and that affects you psychologically and you start to believe believe your own hype and i think that that's an issue uh with all bands and rock bands in particular i don't know that that's the case with jazz or classical musicians well, yeah, I mean, you're you're kind of in the middle of the furnace, you know, as a as a rock band, you you know, whose songs make the album, you know, what, what how's the set list, you know, put together, and it's kind of like being married to five people at the same time. I mean, hard enough to, you know, make one wife happy. Now now there's four four egos that need to be stroked, and there's bound to be somebody uh, who's causing you know some friction. And um, yeah, but there, there's there's power in that band, you know, but really, when you look at it, whether it be sticks or, you know, the orchestra, you know, the songs are really the stars, you know, the singers may change, the era may change, you look out in the audience, there's three generations of people, you know, one of which wasn't even alive, you know, maybe two generations weren't even alive when those songs came out, but they fell in love with those songs who they're parents or big brother or their friends record collections and you know ultimately those songs will live on and i know you learned that as a as a songwriter but um tell us a little bit about the orchestra because obviously you know back when electric light orchestra came out in the 70s it, it was a band you saw all these members of a band and they're playing the cellos and the violins and the all, all, all these different instruments um but but obviously there was a, a a singer you know when jeff lynn became you know more and more the the focal point of the the band but you know it was it was really a, a, an orchestra and a groundbreaking rock band at that T- tell us how you joined the orchestra and you know what what the highlights are of playing those songs with those guys that were you know par- part of it um the story as I understand it is Jeff Lynn decided to um, retire Electric Light Orchestra, ELO. And it really is and was his band. There's no doubt. Although it, it wasn't just him on the records and and on tour, you know, it was a band. And he decided to break the band up. He, he had had enough, he wanted to move on. He became a renowned, you know, world-class producer. About six or seven years, maybe later, the rest of the band of ELO called each other up and said, well, he doesn't want to go out and play, but we do. So they, Don Arden was the manager who helped put together what they called ELO part two. And they replaced a member or two here. They certainly had to make up for the lack of Jeff Lynn. So they got Eric Troyer and uh, a number of other guys. So, but nevertheless, uh, Kelly Grokett, the bass player, 
uh, the original drummer, Bev Bevan, um, Mick Kaminsky, the violinist from ELO. Uh, you know, uh, Lou was the arranger. Um, so much, I think they had the original cellist. They had a number, uh, you know, so it was predominantly ELO without Jeff Lynn, but they put themselves back together and they said, well, we don't want to call ourselves electric light orchestra, but we are part of that. So we'll call it ELO part two. And they, and they were together for 20 years. And again, the story as I understand it was Jeff Lynn was, was working on a solo album. Can you hear that? Yeah. All right. Um, Jeff Lynn was working on a solo album where he was handing it in, handing it into uh, Universal. And, uh, and Universal said to him, um, you know, you'd sell a lot more records if you didn't say this was Jeff Lynn, if you said, if you called it Electric Light Orchestra. I, this is what I understand. So he decided that he wanted to um, make sure that there was no confusion over the names. So he took ELO part two to court and uh, insisted and the only way out of it was they had to change their name to the orchestra featuring ELO and ELO part two met former members. And suddenly around 2009, the original bassist from ELO, who was still in the band called the orchestra at this point, suddenly passed away. And I got the call to sub for him to replace Kelly Grokut um, with this band that's been around for you know over 20 years. 30, maybe 40 years, if you count the ELO record. So that's how I got the call. And I love those songs. There's so many great songs. Uh, Mr. Blue Sky for me is about as great as a pop song can be. I love it. And, you know, all the other stuff, Do Ya and all this. So what a thrill to play these songs with those guys and tour with that band and be a featured member of a band with a great history. That's the orchestra. Yeah, no, it's uh, again, the songs of the stars, Jeff obviously tours, you know, once in a while and yeah, you know, has his version, but he's got so many other songs and albums. So he can't concentrate on those key songs, those key albums, you know, and uh, of course he's so Beatles influence and so involved, you know, having produced George Harrison and, you know, that free as a bird thing with Paul and Ringo. I mean, it's, um, I guess you can't get away from the Beatles. All roads lead back to the Beatles, huh? I guess, especially if you're a certain age, but even, even young acts, you know, I know lots of young musicians who kind of go there too. So uh, in a way it's, uh, in a way it's, it's old people music. But in another way, it's just so good. It's so, you know, it's such pure pop that, uh, you know, I, I have a, one of my grandchildren, she's four years old. She digs the Beatles. You know, it's just kind of a human thing that the Beatles just kind of connected with some magic, you know? Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to sing along, you know, they want to be a part of that energy. And, you know, the Beatles did that best, you know? Um, Famously, those early shows, you, you, you couldn't even hear the band, you know, between the screaming and the singing along with the songs, you know, uh, this is well before they really figured out how to, you know, put PA systems in stadiums and, and stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's timeless music. You, you can't bring it back to a more, you know, basic guttural, you know, primal feeling that everybody wants to sing along everybody wants a song that's so memorable you, you hear it once you want to hear it again you hear it two or three times you can't forget it you know it's just it's it's stuck in your head i mean 
that's what's so amazing even if you think hey i know a few beatles songs you, you you listen to an anthology it's like god i i remember the hook on every one of these songs you know they you remember in lyrics you didn't even know you remembered they're just so ingrained you know um and yeah. i'm talking as a non-singer you know obviously you've uh, studied the catalog much and much but you've you've written a couple great songs with don henley of course the big hit with patty Smythe, and you know those songs live on and you've got a lot of credits bring us up to date tell us about what you currently work on out outside you know the orchestra and uh you know what we can expect coming up from glenn well, it, it's been years uh, since I've done any solo work, but I happen to be writing some new material and recording. And this kind of goes back to my original beginnings that I'm playing drums on this material I'm recording. So I'm playing drums and every other instrument, uh, something I always meant to do, something I always wanted to do, but I just figured, you know, now that I'm in my 60s, why not? you know, give it a go. So I'm enjoying that. I've got some new uh, tracks I'm working on, which who knows when they'll be done. I'm not in a rush with that because I'm very busy with my other things. Uh, I have a, a big production called The Summer of Love, which is like a big musical celebration of the Woodstock generation. Um, and we're playing... Uh, we're playing every weekend in Atlantic City this summer. And it's got a cast of about 20 people. It's, uh, it's just a great show. Tons, tons of talent on stage and, and incredible. We got Pig Light Show behind us. Um, it's a great production. There's that this summer. And the other thing that's keeping me busy, well, the other two things, one of them is uh, I'm playing with Max Weinberg's Jukebox, which is Max is the drummer with Bruce Springsteen. And uh, so we're doing a lot of road work. And then the other thing is uh, a pet project of mine called The Weaklings. It's a band I'm in, there's four of us. And we started out being heavily influenced by the Beatles. And I guess we still are, but uh, we've had a number of records out. We're on our th third album uh, working on our on a live album and uh, lots of other things we, we recently had a single uh, that did pretty well on uh, satellite radio we, we, we've been successful on satellite radio particularly little Stevens underground garage uh, there's a song of ours called three which is the title track off our most recent album that was dubbed coolest song in the world for the year 2020. So um, that was cool. And, you know, we've had a number of songs on that station that have been dubbed coolest song in the world. Um, so the weaklings is really the band that I'm, I'm very involved in. There we are. There's our third album. And, uh, uh, I really enjoy it. I'm the bass player in that band. Uh, I'm one of the singers. I'm one of the songwriters. And uh, it's fun. It's a really fun band. So though all of those things keep me really busy. Also, there's a band in Liverpool that I play with at the Fest for Beatles fans, which is a biannual uh, convention, Beatles convention uh, that plays in Chicago and the New York area like twice a year. And we play all Beatle music for there, for that. So these are a bunch of projects. I'm, you know, I think I'm in five bands right now and that's a lot of work. So even though I am working on uh, solo music, it's not necessarily the priority because I got to learn all this other stuff and I got to uh, stay sharp on all of these other projects that I've got. Yeah, well, you know, they're all connected in one way, and that's your love for music and, you know, your love to, to entertain and express yourself. So I, I know there's priorities there. And in case this phone rings, I got I to gotta take that one and prioritize that. But, you know, it's, um, it's kind of, a, a, you know, a modern time where, 
you know, uh, you've got to have a few irons in the fire, you know, and whichever one heats up next or whichever one is uh, drawn a response, you know, you can kind of lean into it. And I know you're very involved with the uh, benefits, you know, you do your Xmas uh, extravaganza with the, you know, regular holiday shows and help, you know, feed people through the food banks and charitable type stuff. Music has always been a, a great, um, you know, help, you know, for people. It's uh, the soundtrack to our life and, you know, so much more, you know, and I know that uh, that means a lot to be able to entertain people and still help people at the same time. You know, that's a, that's an amazing thing. Now, how can people follow you um, socially? Is there a, a, a website or is it Facebook or um, where, where can people go to, to keep up on, on your activities? Um, I'm mostly available on Facebook. Uh, and there used to be a website, but I, it's not mine. Uh, and yeah, I'm just, you know, if, if you want to know about me, look me up on uh, Facebook and there's, I usually uh, discuss what I'm doing, you know, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not really a super promoting, self-promoting kind of person. You know, I do what I do. I, I will say that all of these things that I am involved in, it's enjoyable for me, the variety of not just having one project. Um, I, I prefer that. I enjoy that. When it's just one project over and over and over again, it's like the same guys. Um, that just gets tired i get tired of that so i and i've been enjoying wearing as many hats as i can uh and experiencing as many different flavors as possible well yeah i know keep keeps you active of course the orchestra.net is where you can find out you know any upcoming um concerts from that project Glenn, it's uh, a real pleasure to catch up with you and share all this uh, musical history and, and inspiration to others. You know, we really hope that um, the future generations continue to pick up instruments like we did, especially after seeing the Beatles. You know, uh, everybody's on their computers and cell phones and, you know, they've devastated music in school. So it's really important. You know, we, we hope uh, the future generations like your four-year-old, uh, you know, grandkid there that, you know, they, they fall in love with some, some music and whether they, you know, make it or write it or just enjoy it, you know, it's, um, so it's been such an important part of our, our lives, you know, we, we definitely want to see that continue forward and with people like uh, little Steven and uh, Max and Bruce and everybody, I, I know they're in the trenches making sure that we all stay, you uh, connected to music glenn thank you so much for joining us we look forward to doing a follow-up with you cool thank you jay and all, all the best